Hi, welcome to today's presentation. Is that my sample? Representative samples and influences on hemp, cannabis, and agricultural sampling. Let's start to think about what are we trying to do when we sample? What are we hoping to get out of it? Well, usually we're trying to get a result. We're trying to get a true value. We want to know what are we seeing? What are we getting from, for our results? This is accuracy and precision. Accuracy is how close you get to that true value. And precision is how close your results are to one another. We often say that's percent RSD. Accuracy can be changed by bias, contamination, or error, where precision can be changed by variation, maybe employee proficiency, or some sort of mistake or error. Now, if you're thinking about good accuracy, that's when your numbers are near your target. So if you are aiming for five, five parts per million and you're getting four, four, five, six, you're getting them in, in a good range. You're sort of hitting that target, but they're really not on top of each other. So you're getting really good accuracy, but kind of low precision. And this can be due to some instrument variations that's very common, like an auto sampler or operator proficiency. So if your your operator, your LC operator or your instrument operator is hand injecting samples, maybe they're injecting slightly different amounts each time. It could be sample variations. Maybe your sample's not homogeneous or maybe there's stability issues with the sample. This could lead to an unacceptable RSD or relative standard deviation. Then you have kind of the opposite, where all your results land almost right on top of each other. Maybe you're aiming for five, so five is your bullseye, but you keep getting seven, 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 seven and a half, seven, six and a half, seven. Well, that's really precise. You're getting it over and over again, very tightly uh, clustered, but you're not hitting your target. This could be, again, some sort of bias of the instrument or the operator. Maybe your instrument's calibrated slightly high or slightly low. Maybe there's something where the, the operator, if they're doing that manual injection, uh, for some reason they add a bubble every single time, which offsets the, uh, the amount they're inject injecting into the instrument. This can also be uh, preparation errors. Maybe when somebody was doing dilutions, they uh, carried an error through their dilutions. So this would give you a really good RSD, a relative standard deviation, and you might be able to correct for that, especially if it's a very consistent bias. Then you have kind of the worst case scenario, low precision and low accuracy. That's where you see the numbers. You're, you're looking for five, but you're getting one, nine, 12, seven, six, five, four, three, zero, 11. So you're bouncing all over the place. This can be, again, an instrument problem. It could be an operator problem and it could be a sample problem. This will give you a very poor relative standard deviation. And then finally, you have what you really want, high precision and high accuracy. So you think the bullseye, you're hitting that bullseye target and all of your shots are all clustered together. This is the goal of, of our samples. Now, when we're talking about sample preparation, of course, we know it's part of a huge um, series of steps and, and methods that you have to go through in order to get a, a data result. And we're going to talk today about sample selection, which is, you know, key to your sample preparation. It's the first step. You want to make sure that your samples are homogeneous, that they're fit for the purpose that you need them for, that they're representative. Because if they're not, then that's going to affect your homogeneity for your sample preparation and for your testing and for your data. So you really have to have good sample selection right off the bat. So what is a representative sample? People sometimes confuse that with homogeneity. Well, if my, I have representative samples, then my sample batch is homogeneous. Not necessarily. Representative samples more more based on the population size. And they're the smallest subset that retains a specific property in a population. So if you're looking for a, a certain, you know, cannabinoid level for a cannab cannabis plant or a hemp plant, then it's the smallest number that you have to have in order to represent that particular property. And it has to be statistically valid. And it needs to be reasonable for the entire population. So if you have a popula population of 100,000 plants, 10 plants is probably not going to be a big enough representative sample for that population. 
Then you have homogeneity. That's more on a sample or batch preparation size. And it means to be uniform in composition or character. And you see this high homogeneity in things like liquids. Liquids uh, tend to be more homogeneous and solids tend tend to be heterogeneous. And agricultural samples, by their very nature, and they grow, they grow differently, they tend to have a low homogeneity. So you really want to make sure that when you're, you're selecting your samples and you're processing your samples, you remember that the bigger the particle, the bigger the sample, the bigger the amount that you have to, to deal with, the less homogeneous this is. So you always want to think about how am I going to increase the homogeneity for my samples. Now I want you to think about uh, the P's of representative sampling. First one is product, purpose, part, and process. So what is your product? What's your starting material? What's it going to look like in its final form? Is it going to be an oil? Is it going to be extract? Is it going to be a finished product? Is it going to be an edible, a topical? Is it going to be something for industry or an inhalable? So what is the product? What's the purpose? What's the purpose of your testing? Are you testing for pesticides or cannabinoids? Are you testing for mycotoxins or fatty acids? What is the purpose for your testing? Where in the process do you take your, your representative samples? Are you going to take it from raw material? Are you going to take it while you're in process? Are you going to take it from your finished sample batches? How much are you going to use of a single sample? How many sampling sets are you going to need? What's your batch size going to be? And what part of what you're sampling, in this case, uh, hemp and cannabis, are you going to take fan leaves? Are you going to take buds? Are you going to take roots? Are you going to take stems? What part are you going to be sampling of that plant? And let's go look at purpose first. Obviously, the most common type of testing that's done in, in the cannabis industry, especially for cannabis for medical use, are cannabinoids. But there are cannabinoids also in hemp. hemp. But there's also test, other testing. There's heavy metals testing. There's res, residual solvents. There's persistent organic pollutant testing, uh, pesticide testing. These are all very important. And they might change the way you sample. It might be terpenes. So if you're testing for terpenes, the way you treat that sample, which parts of the plant you want for that sample may, may be different. So if you look at a, a cannabis plant, there are some areas that are um, very traditionally considered to be high areas of things like terpenes and, and flavonoids and cannabinoids. And those are the trichomes. Those are the flowers, the, those buds. So those are where the highest concentrations of those type of compounds are going to be. But if you're going to look for fatty acid, maybe you're doing hemp as a nutraceutical and you're looking for the fatty acid content, you're going to be looking more at, the, at like the hemp seeds. And if you're using it in an industrial purpose, maybe you're looking for the fiber content. You're going to be looking for the roots or the, the stem or the or the bast or the shiv. So you're going to be looking for the other parts of the plant other than the flowers and the leaves. So which flower, which stem, where on the plant are you going to sample? Well, let's take a look at understanding how a population is divided up. So a population is the entire sampling set. So an entire grow, for example, that would be your population. Then you create a sampling frame. This is the set of possible targets you're going that might be included in your sample. So, okay, you're a grower of hemp and you have, um, you know, 100,000 square acres of, of hemp plants and you've decided that this field in the north corner is the one that's ready for sampling. So you're going to create a sampling fr frame of that field and, and that's going to be where all the possible samples can be taken from. Then you're going to select the sample. Now, a slam sample is one or more targets that you select to include in your bigger sampling plan. And then the unit is the actual part of the plant that you are going to take. So not just which plant you're taking it from. Now the unit is that smallest unit you're going to take for sampling. Then you're going to have to follow some sort of sampling plan. You have to include statistics, the size of your sampling, the method you're going to sample, the schedule, how often are you going to sample, how is it going to be collected, how is it going to be recorded. And there are a lot of agencies that can help you with sampling plans, including FDA and ANSI. 
you're also going to decide on a sample size or uh, a sampling size. And this is usually dictated either by a regulation, uh, a population size, a policy, maybe uh, you use a sampling calculator and you wanna set what your population is, what proportion of that population you wanna test, what's your confidence interval that you want and what margin of error that you're looking for. And then that will spit back out to you out of uh, 100,000 plants, you need X amount of plants to be part of your sampling plan. And then you're going to have a sampling selection. How are you going to, to select what plants to include? Well, you're more than likely going to depend on either probability or non-probability sampling. sampling. Probability sampling is um, more often than not considered to be the better type of scientific sampling because it's more random in nature. And you use random number generators or random number tables. And non-probability is more... Um, more of a, a directed type of sampling. And we're gonna get into the different types. So probability sampling uses random selection and every uh, member of a population has equal chance of being selected. Whereas non-probability sampling is directed or non-random and not every member of that population has an equal chance. And there's usually some sort of bias or an intentional culling of samples. So for instance, a university wants to know uh, what a particular population of this city is going to say in the uh, upcoming public question. Now, you know, you have students, they're maybe not going to go through every square inch of the city and randomly select people. So they say, well, you know, we're going to only select people within walking distance of the college. So they have basically culled their samples or created a bias to those who are within the physical proximity or walking proximity to the college that they're working at. So that's kind of a mix of probability and non-probability sampling. They've already culled their samples and then they may use a probability sampling to, to go to another level. Let's talk about probability sampling. There are different kinds. First, there's simple random sampling. You can use a, a number generator or a table. That means when you have your population, you look at your population, you create a sampling frame. You're going to say, okay, out of this population, out of this field, I am going to only sample um, the, the north section. So you basically plot out where your sampling frame is. Then you use some random number generator or random number table, and it will tell you, you sam sample um, plants number 2, 12, 17, 44, 68, 92, and then you go ahead and you count off and you sample those particular plants. Then you have systematic sampling. Again, you have your population, you're going to do the north area of this field, but you have you know, 20 rows. So you're going to select, oh, I'm going to select four rows. I'm going to select one, row one, two, three, four. And what I'm going to do is now count them. And I'm going to count every third sample. And I'm going to, to take every third sample. So I'm going to take sample number one, I'm going to take sample number four, and so on and so on. So you're basically systematically taking a, a number and you're sampling that number. Then you have stratified sampling. This is where you might have multiple groups. So maybe you have two different varieties growing in this particular field and you're going to sample both varieties, but you don't wanna have samples from variety one in with variety two. So you're going to then group your samples. You're gonna say, okay, uh, variety A is here and variety B is here. And these are going to be separate groups. And then you're going to randomly sample those groups. And then if you have a really big population, like a national forest or something like that, you, you will use something like a cluster sampling. So imagine you needed to sample something in a very, very large space. You say, okay, well, we are going to randomly um, select, we're going to divide up the entire space into grids. Uh, each grid has a, a identification or a designation, and then we're randomly going to sample in, let's say, you know, grids 1, 4, 7, 24, and 8. And then you go and you randomly sample within those grids. Then there are also uh, equivalent types of non-probability sampling. 
So the easiest one is called convenience sampling. And that's a little bit of what we talked about before, where the college students decide to go in and ask uh, the opinion of, the, of this public question, but they decide they really don't want to, to go very far. So they're going to do it, you know, just within the perimeter outside of the college. So it's ease of access, location. For a hemp grower, maybe your grow is up against an area which is very difficult to get to. So you choose to sample uh, closer where it's a little more accessible. So in that case, you pick a sampling frame that's convenient or has an ease of access or ease of location. And you pick samples that are easy to access and are in an easy location. Then there's consecutive sampling. This is uh, very similar to uh, probability sampling, but where you uh, number your rows. So you take a section, you say, okay, I'm going to have rows one, two, three, four, but instead of randomly sampling th those rows, you go and say, well, you know what? I'm gonna sample all of row one. So that then becomes consecutive sampling. Or I'm gonna to, to sample all of row A, or I'm gonna sample all of the plants that are in the very last row of the grow. That is consecutive sampling. Quota sampling. This is where you, again, have multiple groupings and you're, you know, like varieties of species. So you're going to group them into groups A and group B, but then you're going to also now use a convenience type of sampling where you basically pick uh, which samples you want to choose. And finally, you have judgmental sampling, which is, again, for very large populations, maybe you're sampling along the Grand Canyon and you're looking at trees and all over the entire Grand Canyon, but you're only going to sample up at the top and you're not going to sample on the bottom. So you've gridded out your system, but you're going to select grids which are accessible and you use judgment to make that sampling choice. Now, it's always possible when you have a choice that, you know, you're going to use them at different times. The probability uh, sampling is most favored for analytical testing, but there are reasons to use judgment sampling to, you know, or non-probability. Maybe you have a specific theory or a specific hypothesis that you're trying to prove or disprove. And maybe your, your theory is something to the effect of hemp plants grown next to water have higher nutrient levels than hemp plants grown farther away from water. So you are going to purposely select the plants next to the water and the plants farthest away from the water. So you are going to use those to answer specific questions. Maybe you need a combination of sampling, like in our college student uh, example. Maybe, you know, because college students sometimes don't have cars, they have to keep their sampling to places that can be walked to. But then once they've designated the sampling frame of areas they can walk to in this town, then they're going to use some sort of random um, sampling to follow that. And maybe you're going to have a scale, like maybe you're going to randomly sample the entire grow, but then you're going to select which plants within that grow or which sections or which uh, multiple samples on a particular plant you take. Or, you know, maybe you're going to, to combine all of these. So where you're going to sample a plant often depends on, like we said, what you're looking for. You're going to be looking for things like the, the cannabinoids and, and the terpenes and the flavonoids in the flowers, but you're going to be looking for the other products in other parts of the plants. So if we're looking at cannabinoids, of course, the highest percentage is in the flowers. And as you go down to the different leaves and the fan leaves and towards the stem and, and the roots, there are still going to be some cannabinoids and terpenes and flavonoids, but they are going to be a lot lower than in that bud material. Pesticides. How is a plant sprayed? Is it sprayed from overhead? Well, then yes, then the top of the plant is going to have more pesticide coverage than the bottom of the plant. Or is it being sprayed from the sides? So then maybe the side leaves are going to have, on the outside are gonna have more pesticides than the ones on that are on the inside. If you're talking about the stem and the roots and the seeds, well, you know, if you're looking for fatty acids, that's going to be more towards the, the, the seeds of the plant and, and not necessarily in the roots or in the stems. And if you're looking at the fiber, you're really looking for those stems and those roots. You can also see differences in the vertical stratum of the plants. So 
if you think of a plant and it has exposure to all the different elements, the, the cannabinoids are probably going to be higher and the flavonoids are going to be higher at the top of the plant. And as you go down the plant, there's less sun, there's less exposure, you're going to have a reduction of those. Now, light exposure. That's part of the, the vertical ex, uh, exposure or the vertical stratum of the plant. But it also could be if you think of an indoor grow, let's, or maybe even just a, a place that has a lot of sun in one area, but not another. The, the plants that are closest to the sun source for the longest period of time are going to have the most cannabinoids and the most flavonoids. And the ones that are farther away are going to be a lot lower. Now, if you think of a rose together and maybe they be, are casting shade upon each other, then you're going to have an area where there's some shade and there's not going to be as much sun exposure. So you might have lower amounts then. So sometimes it's suggested that sampling be done by light exposure or lumens. Then there are environmental factors. So you have yourself, your grow, and you know that, you know, the sun is mostly going to be in this one area or this one field. So these plants that are uh, closer to the sun are going to have high cannabinoid levels compared to the ones that are farther away from sun exposure. But then you have maybe a, a river on one side of your grow. So then the plants that are closest to the water, maybe they're going to grow bigger. Maybe they're going to have a different nutrient or cannabinoid type of profile. To even more further complicate things, think of a grow where maybe in the next field across the river, there is an, a historical fruit orchard or an apple orchard, which uses pesticides. So even though your field of hemp or cannabis is trying to be organic, the field next to you, the, organic, or the orchard next to you is not organic. So they use pesticides. So what's going to happen is you're going to start seeing that pesticides will migrate. So what happens is then you have to, to think that maybe the plants that are closest to those other fields are now going to possibly have some blowing of pesticides or some migration of pesticides into your area. So you, it's really important to think about your samples in the scope of what product am I going to have? What's the purpose of my testing? Which part of the plant or which part of the product am I going to be testing and when in the process am I going to be testing for it. So now let's look at at samples and samples that are intended for the lab, laboratory. First, you know, you do all your sampling, you've chosen your sampling method, and now you have your sample, your sample lot or your batch. You are sometimes going to combine different batches or parts of different batches together to make primary samples. And then you're going to take that primary samples and put them together to make a bulk sample. This will then go often to go for, for testing. So then when it gets to the testing lab, then the um, lab will start to break down those laboratory sam samples into to different areas for testing. Maybe part of this will go randomly to micro, part of it for heavy metals, part of it for pesticides. Once that section of samples or laboratory samples has been handed to the analytical lab, it becomes an analytical sample. And then that lab will decide what they need to do to it. This is usually where they process it according to a need. So if you need to grind it, this is um, more than likely where it's going to be ground. It might be ground a little early in the process, but usually the analytical samples are, are the time what that further sample processing is done. And then once the sample processing is done, maybe you're going to a pesticide lab and uh, your analytical samples are intended for pesticide testing. Well, you're now going to aliquot or portion out those samples for the different instrument that you're going to use. Maybe you're going to use port part of it for an LCMS, part of it for, for GCMS. So you're going to aliquot out your portions to be tested. So what size samples should you use for analytical testing? Well, it's very interesting. If you think about particle size in the terms of some different writing instruments, an eraser is about five millimeters in diameter. So you know, it's a, a nice little circle. It's definitely very visible. A crayon is about two millimeters, a pencil point about one millimeter, and a fine tip pen about half a millimeter. So if you are using five millimeters, so you you just basically roughly break up your cannabis or you br break up your buds, but your lab requires a 10% uncertainty. So for your calculations and your analysis, you need 10% uncertainty. What you're going to need is 125 grams of sample in order to ensure that your samples are homogeneous. But if you took that, 
that same sample and you ground it down to half a millimeter, you'd only need 0.13 grams of sample to ensure homogeneity. So particle size does matter for homogeneity. I want to give you some final thoughts. Consider those four P's we talked about when you're creating your sample plan. What's your purpose? You know, what, what part of the process are you going to do? What's the product it's going into? Select sampling frame and samples that are fit for the purpose and plan. You, if you're going to be doing uh, pesticide analysis, decide which part of the plants and, and at what point in processing that makes the most sense. Think of any, any unintended bias and try to randomize your sample selection unless you really have a specific purpose. Remember the variations in your geography, your environmental conditions, your lighting conditions. Consider your outside contamination sources. And after samples are collected, always remember that the smarter, smaller particle sizes will create higher homogeneity with less sample. So that will really help you using less sample and ha still having homogeneous samples and accurate results. I want to thank you for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in another presentation.